I have the top of the hour, so let's begin our session. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a couple of fantastic guests who've written a really, really important book, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now I want to introduce this week's guests, and I want to do it on a personal note. Not only do I consider the awesome Noah Pickus to be a friend, not only does the other guest have a perfectly spelled first name, um, but also their topic is something that I just experienced last week. Some of you might recall, if you were here, that I was uh, leading the program from Qatar, in the city of Doha, uh, working in one of these global universities. The topic here is starting up new institutions around the world that have global engagement, global footprint, and participate in the whole world of higher education. They have a new book, which I can't recommend enough, The New Global Universities, out uh, from Princeton University Press. And the goal is to take you through eight examples, eight different universities that are startups, that, and they each have a different plan. They each have a different footprint, a different relationship with other organizations and governments. And our goal here is to learn about their research and their own work, what they've discovered through all of this. So let me begin by bringing up the great Noah Pickus, because Noah has been a guest on the program before, and I'm really grateful that he has joined us again. Welcome, Noah. Thanks, Brian. It's, uh, it's great to be back here to see all of you, and of course, to be interviewed by Brian and with Brian, spelled well, the same. It's going to get pretty, pretty uncanny pretty soon. Um, Noah, where are you today? Where have we found you? I am in Durham, North Carolina. Excellent. Excellent. Where the, the weather is no doubt fairly comfortable outside. Fairly comfortable. Yes. <laughs> no, every time we talk to you, you have so many insights and you seem to do as much work as any 10 brilliant academics. I, I, I hesitate to ask this question. What are you working on for the next year? What's ahead for you? Um, you're, you're way too kind, but you can share that with, uh, with my boss anytime. I will. Um, no. I, I, I have uh, probably three different uh, components um, other than this work Brian and I are doing on this book. One is uh, I'm a dean at Duke Kunshan University in China for academic strategy, and we're at the sort of five-year mark where it's time to have that transition to the 2.0 version of a new mm -hmm. university, so mm -hmm. we're crossing that bridge. Brian and I are working together on gathering uh, 40 new universities from around the world beyond the eight that we did to come together uh, in a summit this summer to talk about um, what they've learned. So those are lessons learned for others who want to found new universities and also whether there might be lessons for established universities. Mm. Uh, and then I have my, my other job at Duke, which is focused on uh, issues that we're all dealing with right now, the conflict in the Middle East, uh, free expression and pluralism, uh, teaching excellence. Uh, so those are the sort of uh, baskets that I'm working in. Wow. Well, I, I, that's, that still awes me with the sheer amount of, 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 of work you're doing, especially building on the new global universities by expanding the number to 40. Um, and that's terrific. Uh, I, I, I can't wait to see more of this. Hang on one second, though. Let me let me uh, bring your colleague up on stage um, while we've got the two of you. So welcome to uh, Vice President Penpraise. Hello. Hello, Brian. How are you? It's nice to be here, and it's nice to uh, also see Noah again. And actually, our book kind of started in a series of these kind of Zoom conversations, almost like a seminar, ah. where Noah and I were kind of teaching each other about all the things that we were learning from our different corners of the earth. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, I'm glad to uh, to bring you back to your, to your roots that way. What um, and that says something of the future that uh, we can have video conferencing being in the past. What um, what are you going to be working on for the next year? Um, what's what lies ahead for you for the rest of 2024? Yeah, well, um, currently I'm on sabbatical, so I'm at a a very global but not particularly new university in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for the year. And I'm studying uh, the future of higher education here with the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, and in particular, uh, the AI revolution that everyone's looking at and how AI is going to make its way into every part of higher education and how we can kind of get in front of it and manage it in 
ways that will enhance the human experience of higher education and not um, put, a, put us into some kind of robot filled dystopia. So I'm very interested in kind of the humanistic aspects of blending high technology and liberal arts and, and how you can get that fusion so that both complement each other. I'm, I'm also doing some traveling. I visited new universities in Malaysia, Hong Kong, and I'm going on another trip to India and Bangladesh in late March. Wow. That sounds like a fantastic uh, sabbatical. You know, the combination of being able to take the time to deep, you know, deeply dive into uh, a complex topic like AI, and then to also uh, travel uh, at an epic mm -hmm. scale, fantastic. Yeah, well, it's been really fun, and this is a good place to be too. There's a lot happening here at Harvard and at MIT, <laughs> and everyone's grappling with the AI revolution right now. Yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Well, welcome, uh, welcome to both of you. In fact, let me here just make things a little bit, uh, a, a little more, more, more balanced, and. Uh, let me uh, let me kick things off, friends. If if you're new to the program, I'm I'm going to ask our our guests, our authors, a couple of questions about their work, and as as we talk, please think about what you'd like to ask them, uh, especially you know both your curiosity based on what they say, but also how their work, how what they describe connects with your own work and your own thinking about higher education's future. Um, the the first question I wanted to ask, and Brian, I gave you a hint of this earlier, is. Your book looks at eight different universities, and they're each they're each different in, in crucial ways. Um, they're all startups. They're all new. Everything from Olin College of Engineering to Minerva to Ashoka University. Uh, and the, at the end of your book, you have this great, great chapter on or for me, it was actually two chapters on on lessons learned. And one of the things you point out is that of these eight institutions, seven survived. And not just survive, but have succeeded really well and established themselves with a global reputation. And you point out that that's an extraordinary success rate. Uh, if you look at business startups, the success rate is the survival rate is usually closer to 40 percent, if not lower. Um, and here you have some triumphs. I'm, I'm wondering if you just quickly tell us what enabled these institutions to do so well. And I, either of you can start. <laughs> Uh, manage this uh, I'll, I'll say a word and then turn it over to you, Brian. Um, okay. I, I, I would say that, um, you know, this wasn't a careful study where we had 400 schools and we selected them and uh, we just, we basically identified ones that seemed compelling to us. We were not running a study. Uh, to me, there were two key features that are a little bit opposite of each other, but were incredibly important. On the one hand, none of these institutions would have survived if they were not completely audacious, if they did not have a vision that was compelling, that drew faculty and students and donors and governments and others to them, and that really promised something that people wanted to uh, commit to and sacrifice for. And at the same time, uh, they exhibited flexibility. They were able to navigate moments when if the founding vision stayed exactly like it was, it would be too brittle. And mm. that combination of uh, sort of gas and brakes, audacity and flexibility, um, really has been the crucial element. And it's also an ongoing one they live every day. Yeah, if I might also jump in, Brian, I really liked your analogy with business, and that was a constant thread in our in our thinking, and both the similarities, but I, maybe more importantly, the differences between a new business and a new university. You know, both are entrepreneurial ventures, both are working to differentiate themselves in a crowded marketplace, and yet the kinds of strategy that you have in a new university are very, very different due to the complexity and the very different numbers and very competing interests among stakeholders in your enterprise. And so we saw that the leaders navigate through this incredible complexity with amazing skill. It was quite inspiring and very dramatic too as well. And because they were able to start from scratch, they were really able to differentiate themselves nicely from other offerings, either in the world entirely or within their region or their country. So they offered something really unique that no one else was able to, to provide. Excellent, excellent. Well, that that so that that sense of uniqueness, distinctiveness, which 
we often think about is higher education strategy. You know, what does my college or university do that nobody else does or not in this way or as well? Uh, and in that combination, I love that gas or brakes, um, being able to be audacious um, and, and, uh, and also to be able to pivot and, and change. We have a, a, a really good question um, in the chat that just came in from Joyce Ogburn, our good librarian friend. And she asks, is there a point where institutions tend to ossify? Noah just raised his hand and put it up no, in front. F five years. Five years. <laughs> um, it's yeah. I mean, you can measure in student lifetimes, or uh, you know, sort of like dog years in a way. Like new universities have a different time scale. So the first year of a university seems like a decade to those involved in it. And Noah and I were both involved in starting new universities. And then by about year five, as Noah's saying, when you have your first graduates out, it starts to then settle into more or less. A, a desire to achieve steady state, partly to the exhaustion that everyone has had from this incredibly demanding startup phase, mm. and partly due also to just the need for signaling that stability that, that both faculty, students, and parents and employers want to see. So there's always tensions in a new university. That's the gas and brakes that Noah's talking about. And the tensions are pushing them two ways simultaneously. They usually find a point somewhere in the middle that allows them to remain innovative but also to achieve stability at about year five. And I would say the, the really interesting point too is when the university becomes older than the students, because we find that in our sample and in other universities I looked at around uh, 18 or so years when they're older than their students, uh, you go through a full life cycle of many of the professors and they're starting to get close to retirement yeah. age. And there's another point of reckoning where the university really has to figure out you know, whether they're still a new university or not. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it, might, it might be worth adding here that, uh, so one of our schools, for instance, that many of you may know, the Olin College of Engineering, which is the oldest of the ones we studied, started uh, uh, just about 25 years ago. Um, and th they've had one president for Rick Miller for a long time, and then in recent years, a second, Gilda Barabino. And we were in a conversation with her just the other day, Brian uh, and I, and on the one hand, Olin has been brilliant in that they have created a culture of continuous improvement. It's not a, every 15 years we will do a strategic plan or a curriculum review. There was a way in which things they really did, like engineers, prototype and iterate and change. And it was clear that that was built into the culture of the place. Yeah. At the same time, as Brian indicated, once you, you become 18, 20, 25, um, and you have to figure out what are the things that need to stay put, and because you need some things to stay put, but also how do you renew that kind of innovative spirit? It is very impressive to us the power of the regression to the mean to oh. begin to look like everybody else, even when your intention was it's precisely the opposite. It's a powerful force. Mm. Yeah. We found a fancy word for it uh, in some of the literature, mimetic isomorphism, but the idea that basically universities copy each other and they do it partly to signal prestige and excellence because everyone wants to look like the fanciest and, and most prestigious university. And, and partially because uh, at least in an existing university, all the pressures are for conforming in terms of being something recognizable to employers. And so being yeah. different is a real challenge because you have to then demonstrate that your quality makes it worth being different. You have to have that real value that, that justifies being a little bit at odds with the other types of universities. And mm -hmm. Olin College is definitely made that case as, as have many of our other schools because they are distinctive. And for example, Olin College uh, ranked right alongside MIT as tops in undergraduate and edu innovative engineering education around the world uh, just recently, all within about 20 years from its being formed. Wow. And the other schools too have been graduating, you know, Rhodes Scholars, sending people to the top PhD programs. Even the one school that didn't survive in its present form, that's Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, mm -hmm. you could think of it if it were a company as, as being taken over right. by a larger one. So maybe you can think of it as a merger because uh, the National University of Singapore has taken it over and is now operating it as NUS College. Yeah, yeah. 
which is which is quite a story and 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 you tell this well uh friends by the way i'm sorry i didn't mention this uh chris jensen asks us in the in the chat um if you haven't had a chance to read the book on the on the bottom left of the screen you should see a kind of tan colored box um that says uh, the new global universities if you click that that should take you to the uh, uh university press website so you can grab the copy um so the new global universities chris is uh, is is the title um we have some questions bubbling up there in the chat, and uh, and please uh, f uh, feel free to uh, transfer those over to the Q and A boxes, friends, so I can uh, I can share them. Or if you want to ask them out loud, let me know. Put a, click the raise hand button so I can bring you up on stage. Uh, again, another question I wanted to ask you to, if I could step back a little bit, um, is why and how make these global universities? Uh, I, I'm asking because we have. Well, in the United States, we have a very different higher education environment than most of the world. You know, we have our privatized, financialized, uh, high student debt system of tuition payment. We also have the demographic problem that other countries are struggling with as well. Um, but also, so many nations right now are turning away from globalization. Uh, either sometimes it's explicitly political, sometimes it's an attempt to preserve local traditions, folkways, ways of knowing. Um, sometimes it's it's pure, you know, right wing politics or or left wing politics. Uh, and of course, we have geopolitical problems, economic problems that are causing difficulties with globalization as a whole. So I guess why and how do these do these campuses throw themselves into the global ecosystem? No, you want to start on that? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start and hand over. I think, you know, when Brian and I began this book, we'd actually, um, our focus, the original title for the book was Startup You. And the, the focus was just on new universities. Like a lot of you, we've worked in existing universities and we have that love-hate relationship. There are all these great things about them. And then there are all the things that frustrate the hell out of us. And in particular, the difficulty of bringing about uh, change. Um, and so we were looking at new universities. And of course, there was, as there is now, a lot of gloom uh, in, particularly in the US context about all the problems with universities, many of which, I, are true. There are real problems and there are uh, external critics uh, of them and internal. And our focus was increasingly drawn to the fact that so many of the new startup universities were uh, happening all over the world. The sun was shining, particularly mm -hmm. universities that were focused on a liberal arts and science education broadly understood. So we weren't looking at somebody who was trying to do, you know, badges and certificates and online degrees. That's a whole nother world, of course. So what we found was that these new universities were all over the world. And in one sense, they weren't global at all. They were often oriented toward driving the regional economy, whether it's Singapore or Vietnam, or it was actually to bring a more innovative education to those regions. And in other times, they were deeply global in the sense that they had students from all over the world, they had faculty from all over the world, and they were consciously trying to create a curriculum and a pedagogy that drew on many traditions. So mm -hmm. it's a bit mm -hmm. of a, it, it, you know, it's a bit of a, a journey you have to go on to get to mm -hmm. the global features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I can jump in, I mean, any university that you start is automatically going to be global just by virtue of the fact that it's inheriting um, faculty and curriculum and ways of uh, academic cultural assumptions that have driven uh, largely from Europe. The American universities, you know, have that sort of European kind of uh, orientation. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, adapting it to other countries, the liberal arts, gives you a chance to import, but also modify and reinvent. And so that was the other part of our, our title. And this is not, in most cases, just a, an American university plot on a foreign shore, but they are genuinely expressing and reinterpreting the cultures of their region, genuinely having dialogues, in some cases for the first time, about this moment in their countries as they reach uh, above colonialism and as they really strive toward greater levels of uh, leadership in, in more advanced fields. And 
especially in Africa, even though many of those schools, like the Ashesi and African Leadership University, which we write about, they were not particularly global in that they weren't like NYU bringing together 110 countries, but they were pan-African. They had aspirations to really bring together the whole continent and to inspire a new generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders, as Patrick Awa, the founder of Ashesi, talks about. So in all cases, I think they were looking to sort of take the local culture and sensibilities and enable the people from the area to reach the greatest heights possible in, in their lives, leadership, uh, knowledge work, if you will, but also a deeper sense of what it means to be human and what it means to be Vietnamese, what it means to be Ghanaian, what it means to be from the MENA region, and not as a Western interpreter would say, but as they themselves would say. And so all these schools have amazing programs that really reflect the cultures that they're rooted in. And this gives rise to uh, actually Noah's invented term, the rooted globalism, which I think, Noah, you can talk a little bit about if you like, but it's a beautiful way to express a type of globalization that is rooted in a particular context and culture. Please do, please do. Well, I, I'll just try to, I'll, I'll make it brief here. I, I think that um, rooted globalism is simply, it, 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 if you think of most education being fundamentally national because there are national systems of education and on the other hand particularly in the west and then exported elsewhere the term of art we've all been used to hearing is it's about global citizenship mm -hmm. um, and that seemed and both of them seem problematic from a educational perspective in that um the tent, the connection between your ethnic, your racial, your religious, your whatever national identity um, is important. Th th those identities are important. So is an increasingly global dimension. And there are tensions between the two. And too often we define, oh, we're going to make, we're going to train you to be citizens of this country, or you're going to be a global citizen floating up there above uh, everybody else. Right. And so we have talked a lot about rooted globalism, particularly at Duke Kunshan University, where the tensions are built in. The assumption is as an individual, you're going to be navigating your life at all these different scales um, and that our governance systems are navigating that. And rather than have an aspiration of here is what the answer looks like, it's to understand what those levels and identities are, where the tensions are, and how best you can navigate them. And that seemed to us, at least, like a more compelling vision than than the other ones on offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I could just jump in one more time, the mm -hmm. thought too, you asked why, Brian, mm -hmm. and indeed now there's a lot of centrifugal forces uh, that are flying making the, the world kind of fly apart. People retreating into nationalistic you know, little enclaves and rejecting the thought of globalism. Yep. And I think because of that, these universities, I think, become all the more important because they are a force for drawing us together and, and finding ways of crossing culture, understanding and deeply learning from each other. And um, I think this is an important and even more important notion today uh, as a way of, of really deeply understanding each other and really working to get a sense of a, a global community that can work together on some of the really intractable problems that we all face. So yeah. I think these schools create leaders that are not just from country X, but do have that more global vision about their, their mission in life and their purpose. And I think that's another exciting thing about these institutions. It sounds I mean, th this is me vigorously agreeing and saying this is fantastic and we need that, uh, especially if we're trying to tackle uh, the climate crisis. But let, let me step out of the way. Let, let me thank you both for those great answers, but then let me also uh, see what the uh, rest of the community uh, would like to uh, inquire about. And again, friends, if you're new to the forum or, or if you're out of practice, just click on the very bottom of the screen and either click the uh, raised hand button if you want to join us on stage. Uh, and unfortunately, it looks now like you either have to have a beard or be named Brian to be on stage, but it's okay. Other, the rest of you are welcome, but, but or uh, click the question mark if you'd like to ask a Q&A uh, question. In fact, we have one of those right now. This is a, a, a quick one for you and maybe pointing towards uh, your, new, uh, your new project. This is from Hal Hepner in, um, uh, in Southwestern University. Any experience with the Universidad de Libertad in Mexico? 
this school uses Minerva Project tools. I believe they're in year one or two. Yeah. Um, so yes, I was uh, at Minerva Project uh, for just over uh, a year, and that's also one of the books. Though the university, not the the project, is the consulting parent organization. Uh, and Brian and I featured the university in the book, and uh, the University of Libertad wanted to create something, uh, they wanted an alternative to the traditional institutions in Mexico. Um, I think they had something of an ideological, they wanted very much Libertad to emphasize freedom and not uh, uh, government control, but they wanted to create a more flexible uh, uh, way for students to get degrees um, and not just simply bachelor degrees, but they wanted to do it in a way that it wasn't what you so often see, which is, okay, we're going to have, um, you know, here are four certificates and three merit badges and you put them together and we'll call that an education. Um, they wanted to do it in a way where there was an underlying taxonomy to the core ideas that they were teaching. And so core principles and concepts and skills were connected across whatever the certificate or badge or degree you were going to get. And they're just in their startup phases, as you indicated. But it's a fascinating example of an institution drawing on one of our universities that we, we featured um, and then adapting it to their particular needs and, and interests and context. Yeah, and this raises an interesting aspect of these universities. Even though they're small, many of them have as few as 400 students, they're having an outsized impact in terms of how they're inspiring other universities. So Minerva has inspired this university in Mexico. Olin has all these different visitors around the world looking at their situation and their approach to engineering education. When I was at Yale and US College in Singapore, we had people all over from India, from elsewhere, even uh, Duke Kunshan University, looking at our design of the curriculum and getting ideas from it. So it's a, it's a really amazing kind of open source uh, flowering of this kind of global liberal arts that's happening. And these schools are all learning from each other and as they grow toward you know, a maturity and, and stability and really becoming leading universities. Uh, I think they can help inspire a lot of other startups, giving an example of, of the fact that they could make it despite all the odds. Excellent, excellent. Well, that, that's a great question. Um, did my uh, did my video just go black? Yeah, you're frozen. Either that or you're very thoughtful right now. I, I'm super thoughtful. Hang on one second. Let me just uh, let me just refresh my screen. Give me one second here. Um, anyway, we can keep talking, I guess, but uh, this is something that Noah, you, you wrote about, and we wrote about deciding that we have a pluralist view of impact, that these are not schools that have 300,000 students. And yet, even though they're small, because they're producing these amazing leaders in their countries that are so dynamic, and because they're sort of models of how to restructure curriculum, to rearrange faculty, to reinterpret the canon in different um, parts of the world, uh, they really have an outsized impact. Uh, yes, I, I think that what we came to, you know, a lot of the conversation, particularly in the US, has quite understandably been focused on questions of scale, because scale is a way to achieve greater access and address equity issues. Uh, I spent a lot of time, I see there's some folks from ASU here. Uh, you know, one of the most innovative, interesting kinds of places, done so many good things. And yet, at the same time, there, Brian and I had this sense that the conversation has become too dominated by the question of scale. If you, you know, that you have to scale up to 100 or 200 or 300,000, or you have to ha be online and have uh, uh, some kind of technological product that you're offering. And our view is that's all important. Sometimes we wonder about the quality of some of those projects, um, but our, our focus was to turn more on, instead of trying to uh, maximize and scale everything, we think there's a lot to be learned from a network, from an ecology of experimentation and innovation. Um, and so we wanted to hold up examples of that, which as Brian has indicated, um, other institutions are not so much 
uh, becoming, you know, they're not joining forces and amalgamating, but they are learning from that and then taking on their own view about what it would do, what, what would happen locally for them to matter. Um, we find that quite inspiring, and it's a more pluralistic ecology, um, although there's always the downside, which is everybody then reinvents their own thing, and there's no uh, meso-level scale where you actually say, well, what if we learn to cross these institutions um, that we would want to replicate in more than one, one place? But in general, mm -hmm. we're, we're pro-experimentation uh, 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 and ecologies um, in, in how we approach this. Yeah, and it might actually be sort of an American tendency to immediately point to size and scale and numerical uh, num measures as a way of, of gauging the, the importance of an institution. But what we're really impressed by these schools, and we selected them for this reason, is for the depth and intensity of the education they provide. They're all residential institutions. They all form very tightly knit communities and so in that way, they're, they're also kind of a, a different kind of mission from some of the larger online universities. The larger online universities are doing fantastic work and, and they're, they're pioneering lots of great things, but that's not what this book is really about. It's about that really intensive, really interpersonal kind of dialogue-based education that's found in our best liberal arts colleges imagined around the world. So I think Brian is really having trouble connecting over there. Well, why don't we, if, if I'm if, seeing uh, his technology. Since I think Brian controls the I don't know stage. If question. Uh, but if there are comments or questions in the in the chat box that we could pick up on, please yeah, feel okay. free. I'm not sure if we're all frozen right now. Uh, yeah, maybe we're all just talking to a frozen world out there. So. John has this comment about. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just I'm. Yeah. So Bill Bill has this uh, question in the in the chat about on the other end of scale. You've talked about campuses taking on their own view or having an epistemological focus. Do these ideas sustain past a certain size? And at at, at one level, we can't fully answer that. That is, some of the. Uh, some of the schools we look at uh, are intend to stay small. Others are ah, Brian. Um, we're we're mid set. Yeah, we were just fielding questions, so we're we're making you um, obsolete. You, uh, obsolete, yeah, exactly. So well, my my on. apologies. Control, get a get a cool drink. We'll we'll take it. My uh, uh, no, we were just trying to fill in for you, um, Brian. Well, you two are marvelous. My apologies. My uh, my Mac Mini has been. Uh, having some interesting issues of video conferencing lately. So mm. I, have, I have switched to another laptop and it apparently has the approval of one of the cats um, nice. who, is, who is here to say hello. Um, so you're literally herding cats then, as you mentioned earlier. Every, every day, it never stops. Um, we, we have, a, would you mind if I delved into some of the questions that have come up? Please. Um, this is one that is from um, a wonderful, uh, great student of mine, uh, Anel Albert Tao. Uh, and she asks this classic question, um, which is, uh, how do you nav how do these universities navigate the politics within their community, state, and country? Yes, with great care. Yeah. No, you wrote a, a lot about that in the, in one of the chapters. You, yeah. So a, let me, let me just pull out one parental. one aspect of that, um, which is uh, most of these are broadly speaking, liberal arts and sciences institutions, and a number of them are operating in non-democratic or authoritarian settings in the UAE, in Singapore, um, uh, uh, in Vietnam. Um, and part of the story we tell is how they try to navigate those tensions. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, critics, often from home campuses, who uh, whose views are this is destroying liberal education. It, there's not going to be any academic freedom. Um, uh, you're teaching students things that they can't possibly practice. Um, in the book, we articulate those views and we articulate the views of many of the founders and leaders of these institutions who I, I think take a 
uh, an approach of they have to be careful about the risks, but it's too easy just to say, well, let's keep things uh, in our nice, nicely tended campuses with flower beds and where we think we have academic freedom, although that, that's a whole question un, unto itself. Uh, in the West, um, we need to actually try to do this in places where it is challenging and where it is difficult. Um, and, uh, uh, and how we navigate that is what you should judge us on. And there's a deeper level question here, which is, on the one hand, there's a desire in many parts of the world for an American style liberal arts education, often because it seemed to be a driver of innovation uh, in the economy and technology. But of course, it brings with it a lot of other issues. Um, uh, and the, the question of whether a, a Western-based liberal arts approach is fundamentally individualistic, less community-oriented, less collaborative, how it works with not only authoritarian governments, but cultures that have uh, more communal uh, dimensions. So Confucianism is one example in Singapore and in China. Um, you can find it in lots of other places. The, the, all I can tell you is we try to tell the story of um, where we think the, the risks are and how the people have navigated them. But our own view has been that, uh, that trying to navigate them is worth doing rather than just writing it off. Yeah, and if I might quote from the book, uh, it, we were talking about how it's easy to criticize the hard task of advancing intellectual freedom and human creativity in what in the book we call imperfect and fraught circumstances. Mm. And the book mm. points out that there's sort of a moral division of labor, and as the book says, uh, in which proponents of unfettered academic freedom defend the garden walls, and in some cases, institution builders are tending the new vines that must grow in more inhospitable terrain. And I thought that was, uh, I mean, I think you wrote it, Noah, so I'm gonna give you credit for a very nice sentence. Uh, but it's, a, you know, it's not a perfect situation, but it's a, a, a situation where these schools can really play an important role in maybe redefining citizenship in some ways and really opening up conversations that hadn't happened otherwise. And the one example we write about is the way the Vietnam Studies course at Fulbright Vietnam took life uh, as a response to the government requiring a Ho Chi Minh thought course. Mm -hmm. And they actually did it so well that other people from the government and other universities have started to adopt parts of their curriculum. That's a, that's so huge for Vietnam. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a very, very fraught environment. And um, yeah, that was a very inspiring story. Thank you. Thank you both for, the, uh, for these answers. And Anel, good to see you. What a great question. Uh, we now have a uh, video question coming from our friend Chris Jansen at Ed Studio. Let me just bring her up on stage. And there she is. Hello, Chris. Hello. Okay. I have to tell you, I got this in my stocking for Christmas. It is emergency mustaches. <laughs> so I'm so excited that I can break one out because even though I can't put a beard on, I'm going to do that. So I can, I can sit on stage here with you guys. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so try to take me seriously here, okay? Well, very seriously now. Very seriously. Yes. Okay. First of all, I already bought your book. I just bought it. Great, great choice. And I'm like so, so excited. My heart's racing. My belly's on fire. I love this freaking topic. I used to be a professor. I'm in New York City, Chris Jansen. I used to be a professor at Fordham in the business school for 12 years, direct of entrepreneurship. And I left three years ago and I created my own campus in virtual reality. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to, I, I, I can't wait to talk to you guys. It's, it's the, 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 demands of the workplace, the needs of students, all this stuff. It's just not happening within the animal. And I, I'm like, let's engage, you know, emerging technology, whether you want to talk VR, AI, um, focus on experiential learning. Um, I put this whole consumer program together. And quite frankly, I had to pivot after a year because to get people to as much as there's demand out there for something new, better, different, 
we're so ingrained with higher ed means going to a college, a four year college and paying a boatload of money and da 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 and alma mater, this and that. And then, but we're, we're too many people aren't thinking of well, what's the end result? What, why are you even doing this? Is it supposed to be, you know, get you ready for a career? So I have a lot of thoughts on that grades, how we assess people. Are we um, even listening to industry and giving them students with the skills or in demand? Kapowie. But anyways, I would love to talk to you guys more about this um, because there's so much opportunity out there and it really is what's best for the students um, and preparing them for, you know, fast paced fast changing world that we live in. Um, but I cannot read, wait to read your book. And thank you for doing that. And um, Brian, great to see you. And thank you for hosting this. I'm going to stop talking, but I really look forward to talking to both of you. I'm so on, on the same page with you and so hell bent on making some change. So anyway, the end. Uh, oh, oh, God. Oh, oh. <laughs> Can I respond um, just because... I love your energy and uh, the mustache as well, Chris. Um, and I think what you're pointing to is really, we're all in this together. You know, this is a community of people who really see that things can be different and are actually making it different. And and in our book, we, we tell the stories of people who've left secure, comfortable circumstances and at great personal risk and difficulty jumped into this crazy world and they did it because they had that vision and they had that commitment to students. They really believed they deserved better. And we write a lot in the book about how a lot of universities are kind of old and a lot of uh, them may be resting a little bit on their laurels uh, based on their prestige. And one quote that we use uh, from Steven Trachtenberg, uh, he says, college is like vodka, a flavorless beverage that people will spend more on if it comes with a brand name, because the name signals something about the buyer, but not about the product. Uh, so the truth is, is building something that actual, actually substantively is high quality and is different. And I think these schools are all striving for that. And in and, and almost every case have actually done it. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Kudos to you guys. This is really awesome. It is. And I'll follow up with you. Thank you. And uh, and this once again, we have the idea of offering a future transform line of uh, beard supplements um, for for anybody to the product uh, idea. Yeah, I, I think it is. A, there's a branding opportunity. We we we've had a couple of questions about libraries in this respect, and I, I wanted to put one up on, on. And Noah, you kindly answered one in in, in the chat. Uh, and here's one taken this from Elaine Lasta at uh, uh, Albany uh, SUNY. Did you examine how these concepts of continuous improvement, audacious vision, flexibility, et cetera, affect the libraries of these institutions? What is the role of the library? And then she goes on to say, how does it contrast to our, and I think, how does it contrast to um, everybody else's normal roles? I can think of two things right off. One, uh, Minerva University, which Noah, you would know, but it doesn't have a campus. So it's entirely online with its library, I would imagine. Um, and Yale and U.S. College, where I used to work, they merged the IT and the library together mm -hmm. along with the makerspace, and they had a dean-level position managing all of those functions. And so I think in a lot of cases, they've had the freedom to reinvent libraries and construct them in a more modern context and really emphasizing the, the need for uh, a lot of electronic materials but also the way that a library is, is kind of more of a collaborative space and, and takes on a lot of other functions in the, these days, more than, than storing books as a, as a historic function. And so that actually is a big cost saver too for these universities because that nowadays you don't need to build a library with a million volumes, which used to be the draw of a college. They would always list how many volumes the library had. Yeah, yeah. I I, I, I think I'm honor bound to say my, my wife, who I think is on this call, <laughs> is uh, works in the uh, archives, uh, Rubenstein Archives here at Duke. And we debate this often because I think there's also a trade-off here, um, which is on the one hand, there are lots of libraries, as I'm sure the questioner is part of, are reinventing themselves and um, have become hubs for so many different kinds of things. 
And at the same time, a lot of the new universities, they lack the depth and the archival resources and the ability that we provide to many of our, our students right there locally. And so, you know, we're not holding up these global institutions or these new universities. They've had to make trade-offs about what they're gonna do that are, I think, appropriate to their setting um, uh, and to their, their financial uh, plan. But it, it doesn't mean that everything, they're, they're, they are also missing things. And we just need to acknowledge that. Um, uh, uh, and so when students are comparing universities, we all know they can all look the same uh, on the surface, uh, but, but you look a little different, deeper and, and you see some of these differences. Yeah, and it also is kind of a paradox of a university. They're kind of poised between a curatorial mission to preserve the past and its culture and a future facing mission to launch students into a very uncertain and changing future. And I think it's safe to say that these schools uh, being newer universities are emphasizing a little more of that future component and a little less of the, the traditions. And I think there's room for both. And I think one thing we found in this study is that there's a whole diverse taxonomy of universities. They have different missions and different strengths. But these ones are definitely looking forward more than, than trying to preserve um, the past. There's a there's a, a rapid exchange going on in the chat right now. We've we've quite a lot about uh, how libraries are already changing and how these might be. But again, it seems to me that what you're what you've identified in in, in this work is glimpses uh, glimpses of possible universities uh, to come, and uh, that includes definitely the library. We have we have two questions left. The one is a very specific technical question, and one is a grand strategy question. So. Can, I pres can we start off with the technical question because and then we can make we, then you can build on the uh, on the uh, on the grand one uh, and this is uh, one for our good friend Tom Hames uh, coming to us from uh, I believe from outside of Houston uh, and he asks is there a correlation between immigration visa restrictions and universities opening campuses abroad was this a driving mm -hmm. factor mm -hmm. I mean absolutely like for African Leadership University, for example, they began in Mauritius, which was a much easier place to get visas than South Africa. And they ended up in Rwanda also. And Singapore uh, being a natural home for lots yeah. of different nationalities, same with UAE, uh, it, it was a natural spot to put a global university. So yeah, I think definitely countries that were either already cosmopolitan or seeking to become more so uh, were ripe and good sites for these kinds of universities well that's that's a great answer that's a it sounds like tom as usual your your question puts a finger on the pulse really really well that's a very very important aspect of this yeah there's um, an interesting book out um that i really like it's called the geography of genius and it talks about like these idea yeah. capitals throughout history yeah. and i yeah. think that was also part of the ambition of, of say NYU Abu Dhabi, which very much wanted to become a talent magnet from around the world. And mm -hmm. also Singapore what really wanted to, to be a hub of knowledge industries. Yeah. So I think there's definitely that kind of um, inspiration driving a lot of these universities. I've heard that from um, some different uh, stakeholders in Southeast Asia wanting to be a, a, a regional hub. Well, thank you for that great answer, Brian. Um, and uh, let, let me now just step back and ask um, the larger question. Um, which came, comes from our good friend John Hollenbeck, the other end of the U.S., in the, the capital of winter in Wisconsin. And John asks, what problems were these new universities trying to solve? And what does the facet of being global bring to bear in the solution? Now, you, you two have been speaking to these, this, this question for the past hour in different ways. And I'm, I'm wondering you know, what you would add to this. Uh, it's a design thinking question. You know, what problem are you trying to solve? And then... Um, what makes this, um, what else does global add to the picture now? So I'll, I'll start and hand it over to Brian. I, I think at, at one level, they were trying to solve very different things. Uh, and global was not necessarily, um, global was relevant in terms of the ideas they drew on, but it wasn't, as I said, Fulbright University, Vietnam, was trying to create a new kind of educated, innovative 
uh, uh, more liberally trained citizen and and worker. Um, that you know, it, it's an explicit regional strategy. Um, whereas Yale and US and NYU Abu Dhabi were basically not only related to the regional strategy, but the global thing they wanted to do is they wanted to create a new incubator for truly a global leadership. Uh, you know, when we most of our American campuses, um, uh, the leadership being trained includes some international students, right? But it is still within an American context. And so they were truly more global in their student bodies. Others like Minerva, basically they were incidentally global, which is to say they had a critique of higher education that they believed was just fundamentally flawed curricular and pedagogically. Um, and they had a technology that they believed enabled them to do better. And then it turned out that you won't be surprised in attracting students. The students were less focused on the pedagogy and the curriculum than by the tagline of uh, 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 seven countries in four years. And so the global dimension was part of their strategy um, to shake up how students learned, but it wasn't, um, but it was a, a downstream from their specific larger goal. So there's really not a single answer, I think, across all of these. At least I don't think so, but Brian may, may disagree. Yeah. And, you know, the, the fun thing about the book, which I think everyone should buy and enjoy, is that every one of these founders had a vision. So they definitely were trying to solve a problem. And the one one example of all eight, everyone has these stories, but the one I think is particularly dramatic is Patrick Awua, who had a very comfortable life in Microsoft. And then he actually was triggered by the Rwandan genocide, the war in Sudan, and the birth of his first child. And when he looked at his eyes of his child, he talks about how he needed to give back to, to Africa. And he talks about this uh, as, a, as a, his new mission. And he realized he'd turned his back on the continent. So now, as he described it, he's thinking about an African re renaissance. And he says, and this is one of his quotes, I'm thinking about an Africa that has emerged to be an equal partner in the world polity economically doing well, culturally doing well, an equal player on the world stage. Mm. An Africa that is more interconnected within itself and an Africa where the young people on the continent feel a sense of pride and confidence. And every one of these leaders in all eight chapters have stories like this, where they're really trying to solve very, very deep and very, very heartfelt problems. And I don't think we have time to go into all eight. You're going to have to read the book. But that's what's so exciting about these leaders is that they're so passionate about their project. It's not an academic project, in quotes. It's actually something they feel very deeply. That's a very, very powerful conclusion. I, I, I'm wondering which of these eight, or perhaps which of the 32 others that you're looking at, um, is the most global? You know the most non-local, the one that is closest that the, the closest thing we have to a mm -hmm. civilizational university. You know, I, I, you want to handle this one? Well, I, I mean, my my answer. I, I think there are two that presented themselves. I think Yale and U.S., which Brian helped create, really had the most remark. They built the most global core curriculum. So if you just look at that and you say, there's a Western core curriculum, what do you do when you include China, India, and other countries in that? It really is remarkable. They then ran into the problem, of course, of, well, who else are they leaving out as they expanded that? Um, and I think Minerva sought to be the most global in not only in having students go to seven different countries, right. but their uh, proposition is that there's a set of underlying habits and concepts that b across the world are relevant. Um, and so it's less about uh, great books or great traditions and more about a core set of 100 key concepts. Now, mm -hmm. you can challenge and question that, but the yeah. aspiration was that's what everybody should know everywhere. Yeah, and don't forget NYU Abu Dhabi, which was sometimes called the world's honors college had 115 nations represented, would admit a student from anywhere on earth and pay all of their expenses. 
and genuinely wanted to bring in the best talent from anywhere. And we tell stories about a st street kids who heard about the place and, and got full scholarships and now are working in the government at UAE. Uh, just fantastic um, stories like that. Well, for the, I mean, the, these stories are what your book tells and this vision is what your book relays. Uh, friends, we are unfortunately uh, out of time. Uh, this has been an extraordinary hour. The, the two of you have, have showed us an alternative version of higher education that is both inspiring and audacious, fragile, and yet still rewarding. Thank you both so much for all of this. L let me ask, how, how can we keep up with the two of you? Uh, Brian, my namesake, how, how can we keep up with you in your... Uh, Sabbatical. Should we follow you on LinkedIn? Is that the best way? You can do that. And I also have a blog that I uh, write to less frequently than I should, but it's called BrianPenPraise.org. And it's sort of a media platform that has lots of posts and Very good. other materials related to the book and other projects I work on. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Noah, besides bringing you back um, on a regular basis, how else can we keep up with you and your work? I, I, I'm still struggling with social media, but LinkedIn is probably best. That works. That works for all of us. Um, Brian, Noah, thank you so much. Um, this has been an, an honor and a delight, and we're really looking forward to what you do next. Brian, thank you for hosting us. It's great to be back, and thanks, everybody, for sticking with us for, for the hour. It was great to engage. Oh, yeah, thanks, pleasure. everyone. This has really been great, and thanks, Brian, for uh, the opportunity to share this with everyone. A real pleasure. Thank you both. Um, friends, don't go away yet. We need to tell you just to wrap things up. Um, thank you all for the great questions uh, that have kept everything going. If you'd like to keep talking about this, about you know Yale uh, National University of Singapore and, and global universities and all, you can do this actually on the various social media forums. Use the hashtag FTTE to keep up, and you can find me here on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, and my blog. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we've talked about international education as well as some of these institutions, just go to our, our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you want to look ahead, here are some of the sessions coming up. We've got a whole bunch. Just go to our website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And thank you all again for a terrific hour of conversation. Great questions, great thoughts, wonderful projects. I hope everybody is doing well. And please join us next week where we'll talk about our eighth anniversary. Hope you're all well. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>